Today is July the 23rd, 2019. Anna, did y'all notice a little cooler today? Yes. Did you know it's going to be cooler tomorrow? No. Did y'all thank the Lord for it being cooler today? Yes. Oh, yeah. I went out on the front porch and thought I was in the wrong house. <laughs> Actually, some cool hit me. Okay, let's prepare ourselves in our usual fashion. We'll have a few moments of silent prayer, the option of rebound if necessary. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come here and learn the whole realm of doctrine. It just depends on our desire. We don't have to have a formal education. It doesn't matter what our IQ is. What matters is our desire to learn and grow, which you command us to do. And we are here in obedience to that command, but we're here also because we want to be. We're eager. We just can't get enough doctrine. It is as important as the air we breathe. And as the days get darker, the more important that doctrine becomes to us. And so we pray that you will help us to focus, concentrate, have an open mind. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I was watching a YouTube yesterday, and it was a panel. And the panel had uh, Dr. Uh, what's his J uh, Peterson on it. What's his first name? Jake. Uh, anyway, Jordan. Jordan. Yeah, Jordan Peterson. Have y'all heard of him before? Yes. If you if you ever had, he's a oh, it's not a psychology. Yeah, psychology. He's into psychology, and he's very. Uh, a learned man, he, he came into prominence when Canada was going to pass a law that had punishment of fines and going to jail if you did not call transgender by their preferred uh, pronoun. And he came into prominence when he said, not going to do it, and nobody should have the, have the uh, right to tell other people what they must say. And so he just flew into prominence then. He was a, a, a professor of psychology, and his lectures were online, and they all went viral. And now he's well known across uh, the, the world. And so if you ask me if he's a believer, I don't know. I would tend to think not, but I'll tell you something in a moment that would give you an idea of what Mount, about where he stands. This panel had... From my viewpoint, on the far right, you had a radical feminist, which means she should have been on my far left. But she was on the far right, and she had the meta-narrative, and the meta-narrative is just another word for a, a worldview, that the feminists are doing wonderful things, and she was ready to argue with anybody who thought otherwise. Next to her was an author, a young man. I call him young. I guess he was in his 40s. And, well, don't y'all? I mean, all y'all that have gray hair, when you look at someone 40 years old, we think that they're a kid, right? And if they're Matthew's age, <laughs> children, right? <laughs> so, we we have this uh, this guy that was and he was a conservative he was great then you had the guy in the center that was the moderator kind of in charge of things to his left was another feminist but kind of a more moderate feminist to his le to to her left was Jordan Peterson and to his left was a transgender male a transgender male look looks like he was in his sixties. 
And I was, I had an open mind and I was just watching the panel and they would, they were going through different things. Uh, oh, one other thing about Jordan Peterson. Another thing that got him into prominence was there was a woman that was interviewing him and she was exceedingly aggressive, just trying to uh, pick a fight on every single thing he said. And this is where they zeroed in. She said, she asked him, what gives you the right to offend me when do, by your freedom of speech doesn't trump my freedom not to be offended? That was her, her uh, statement to him. And he started laughing. He nearly fell out of the chair. And she said, what's the matter? He says, if you can think and you can speak, then there's going to be people offended. So if you want to, if you say you have the right not to be offended, and by the way, that is not codified anywhere, then you just have to go live in a cave somewhere because when people speak, other people usually are offended. Some of them are and somehow. And she said, um, well, I think you've got me on that one. And for her to say that, I mean, if you'd have seen, he told her, he says, you've been offending me ever since I sat down. He says, it's pretty uncomfortable. He says, but I'm not. Did you ever hear me complain? Did you ever hear me say, I have the right of not to be offended? You know, that, put him, that went viral and that kind of put him in prominence as well. The reason I'm bringing all this up because at one point they went to what they called a religious question. The people out in the audience just could raise their hand, they'd give them a mic and they'd ask questions. And it revolved around the idea, the guy asked the whole panel, do you believe in God? And I was kind of surprised at some of the answers. The feminist on the far right which I would not think that she was a Christian by any stretch of the imagination, said she was a Christian and that she was a head of some Christian organization or something. And I, that kind of floored me a little bit. The second guy said, yes, he's a Christian. I figured he was. Then you have the one to the left of the moderator who was a moderate, somewhat moderate feminist. And she says, I'm an agnostic and has always been. And that what really surprised me he skipped Jordan Peterson was going to ask him last, and he went to the transgender man. And he was unlike any transgender I have ever seen or heard. I didn't see a shred of arrogance in him, but he was dressed up like her. And I don't remember what that, his name was supposedly supposed to be. And he agreed with everything that Jordan Peterson said. And I was just taken aback by that. But this is what really got me. He said, yes, I am a Christian. He says, I've been a Christian since I was, I don't know how, you know, in his teens maybe. This guy was also in the armed services, I suppose the army. And he says, he said, I pray every morning when I wake up and I pray every evening when I go to bed and I pray several times during the day. I thought, man, he prays more than most Christians do. And here he is, a transgender. And I was just surprised by that. And then, of course, Jordan Peterson uh, says what he always says. It's very unclear. He says, I'm just scared to death that there is a God, is the way he relates to that. But what I'm, the reason I told you all of this is for you to understand that all of them were missing the mark because they were, they were, insinuating, they were suggesting by their conversation that the way to be saved is to believe in God. No one has ever been saved by believing in God. Or whether you want to call him a, uh, what do they call him, the, uh, I can't think of the name now, the super being or the, yeah, the supreme being or any of that has nothing to do with eternal salvation. And no one in the audience or on that panel, nor the moderator ever pointed that out. There have been, but, but millions of people will probably see that by the time it's finished going through the series it has there on, on the uh, YouTubes. And I thought, wouldn't it have been wonderful if someone would have said, you know, all what you're saying is fine and dandy. 
But that doesn't get you one foot closer into heaven. And because of, in John chapter 14, what did Jesus Christ say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Now that would be enough to set them on edge. I mean, I, that is probably the most controversial verse in the Bible. There's a lot of them. But people out there, for the most part, have the idea that you have your way and I have my way. No one can say that your way is right and my way is wrong. And so we're all going to the same place. We're just taking different paths to get there. Have you ever heard that bilge? And that verse just puts a stake through the heart of that kind of thinking. And when you say that, and you say it with dogmatism, which is the only way that you should say it, get ready to be attacked. And so I don't know how many people have seen this video or how many were there. There's a huge place, probably three or 400 people were there. But all of them missed the boat altogether. So why I'm telling you is the next time that someone starts talking about, do you believe in a creator? Do you believe in a supreme being? Uh, do you believe in God? Uh, that's, that's all fine and dandy, but you need to point out it is your obligation to make Jesus Christ the issue in salvation because he is. And it'd be interesting to find out what people say when you make him the issue, and not just God. Because it sounded like, oh, well, if you believe in God, well, you're in. Well, what God? There's a lot of gods out there. Um, the Muslims worship Allah, and there's probably more gods than you can think of, and yet there is one Jesus Christ. Don't you think it's curious that when people like Bill Maher, do you all know who Bill Maher is? He is a flaming atheist. And I heard him uh, talking to Jordan Peterson on a YouTube, and Jordan Peterson, Peterson made a comment, and Bill Maher said, Jesus Christ. Now, that's probably blasphemy because he didn't mean it in a good way. He's kind of like swearing by Christ's name. But I'm, I've always thought it was curious. Why didn't he say Buddha or Dalai Lama? Or something like that. The ones that say they don't believe in Jesus Christ, there was no Jesus Christ, say they swear by his name, and he's always the one that is the issue. And that is not by happenstance. That's because I think deep in their psyche, they do know that Jesus Christ is who he said he was. And all of this is that they are dodging accountability. The farthest thing they want to do is to acknowledge that even God exists, much less that Jesus Christ is the Savior. They don't think they need a faith Savior. If they do believe in a heaven or thereafter, hereafter I should say, then they think they're doing just fine. They're on the track. The trajectory is good. That By the time that they die, they're going to have enough good works to get them in. That's what they're thinking. And to give them the gospel, you have to hit them right in the face with that is a lie. And what they've been so proud of all these years, they have been building this huge mound of human good. Things that they're proud of. And they think that they're superior to other people. Uh, they don't fornicate. They don't murder. They don't do drugs. They don't do all these things. So th their, their security is in their works. And if you're going to do the right job in giving the gospel, you have to say those that all that good you do stinketh. It is something that God abhors and he will not accept even one. And so the more good you do, the deeper you get in the pit, the further you get away from heaven. You tell them something like that, they won't like it, but I can assure you they will remember it and that's what's important. So that's my little spiel for uh, what I did yesterday. So let's open our Bibles to Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. So 
Okay, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. Finally, brethren, he's bringing it to a close. close. You'll notice that Philippians only has four chapters and 23 verses, and we're in verse 8. So we don't have that much further to go, but he's already in this verse coming to a culmination. He's going to start summarizing things. But if I ask you to explain to me the thrust of the verses, verse 6, 7, and 8, would you be able to do so? You should be able to. We spent enough time on these. What is verse 6 all about? That's right. Be anxious for nothing. Remember, anxious means what? Worry. So it says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, through prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. So what he does there is say, we are commanded not to worry. So that tells us what? We can accomplish this because God doesn't command us to do the impossible. And then it tells us how. Whenever we're, we're, we're worried, whenever we have a burden on us, we go to the Lord in prayer and just dump it on Him, give it, commit it to Him. It's no longer ours. And we thank Him for that. And we do that by making our request known to God. When we make our request known to God, that's the time to thank Him. Because we know he's going to answer that prayer. He promises that he will. And that he will have a way of escape for us that we are able to endure it. Not that he's going to remove it or sidestep it. We're going to go through it. But he's going to give us a way of escape where it is bearable. And we are able to grow and learn. But the main thing, part of that giving thanks to God or to the Lord is the fact that we get to see him fight for us. We see him in a supernatural way take care of the issue that we can't handle. And so we're thanking him that he even cares for us, that he will do it. And then we're thanking him for he does it. He has the power to do it. He's got the will to do it. And then we rejoice. You see, all that is in that one verse. Okay, for, and then you get to number seven. Verse seven is really a result of verse six. Because once you've done that, once you put your burden on the Lord, and you thought, you've thanked him already for taking care of it because he's surely going to do it. He hears your prayer. And then in verse 7 it says, And the peace of God that passes all understanding shall guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So once you do that, you, you start experiencing the peace of God. What does that take? It takes humility. It takes faith. When you do that, when you believe it, then the pressure's off. The pressure's on God, but of course, he doesn't feel pressure. He's omnipotent. So you're going to have that peace that passes all understanding. Isn't that what you want? When you have a burden, when you have an issue, isn't that what you want? Above all things, you just want to be at peace in your soul and not be worried and tortured by what might happen. All that is garbage. It's gone. And so that was, that's what we see in verse 7. And then in verse 8, we have, verse 8 is giving you how to maintain that peace of God that passes understanding. I mean, when you, when you pray and you believe Jesus Christ that he's going to take that burden, he's got your back, he's going to take care of it, you have that peace, but the issue now is keeping that peace, and that's what verse 8 is all about is thinking on these things will help you maintain that peace. How many times have I told you we have a choice? When there is trouble, when there is chaos, when there is foreboding about all the things that could happen, what you want is peace. And the way that you do that is don't concentrate on the problem, you have a choice. You can think about the things that are listed in verse 8. And when you are concentrating on the things that are in verse 8, 
You forget about the problem. I mean, literally, you can forget about the problem when you are so focused and meditating on these things that are uplifting, these things that are inspiring, these things that give you peace and courage and comfort and security, all those things that people want. That's what those few verses are doing. In the middle of all this, we have this very powerful three verses that is the key to the abundant life in your soul. It's all what it all it's all up here that where the ball game is. And this handles that. Okay, with that in mind, I'm going to pick up where I left off last time. I'll put it on the board for you. When a thought comes into my, to our minds, we should subject it, this is last time, I'm just a quick review. We should subject it to the test of whether it is true. That's what we should do with everything, should we not? What standard do most people use to determine if something is true or false? We went on this, I'll just fifth, run through it. Most people, they weigh it through the filter of what they were taught growing up in their family, what their parents taught them. That is very powerful. It sticks with people even into adulthood. I've told you before that I'm, I'm just very minimum when it comes to cars and mechanics. But up, I was up in my 50s or 60s, and one time I, I questioned for the first time. I changed the oil in my car, and every time that I changed my oil, I used Quaker State. Some, one, one time somebody, why do you use Quaker State? And I started thinking, and I, the truthful answer was because my daddy did. I, there, no question, every time, a Quaker state. You think those things don't stick with you? That's one of the things that were that materialized. What about all the psychological things that you were brought up with? Because children believe what their parents say, and it sticks with you. The second one is what they learn from their friends, and I shudder to think about some of the information and advice and so-called knowledge that I got from my friends. I mean, little boys are nasty. All of them. If you would just, if you ever were a little boy, you would know that. You ladies ought to be glad that, or we should be glad that you don't know what really bo little boys are all about. Because <laughs> you wouldn't have anything to do with any any male anymore. So uh, they learn from their friends. They learn what they learned in school. I mean, when I went to school, I was not motivated to learn. I was, I was motivated when we had lunch. I was motivated when I played football. I was motivated when we had the time between the classes when we could go out in the hallway and we could look at girls. That was the three highlights of my high school years. Junior high too, I guess. I don't, that's been a long time ago. So, in, in some ways, it's good that I wasn't paying that close of attention because a lot of things, even back then, that were taught simply were not true. Or they didn't give you enough information to really have any clarity. Well, they learned in church, synagogue, or cathedral. So I'm talking about here, Christians, Jews, or Catholics, it doesn't matter. A lot of people stick, uh, it, it, the, what they were taught holds into their minds for a long time. And most of it for churches, synagogues, and cathedral, what you probably learned was crapola. Didn't have anything to do with grace. Didn't have anything to do with how you get to heaven. I'm still amazed even to this day that when you go to Christ, uh, talk to a Christian, Average Christian, wherever, and the church-going Christians, and you ask them, what is the gospel? How does one make it to heaven? They'll give you 15 different answers, and most of them are fuzzy. They don't even know, they don't have a clue. Why? Because they no, no one actually taught them the mechanics of what it takes to go to heaven. It's very simple. It's faith alone in Christ alone. And most time, most of the time when you hear someone give the gospel or talk about giving the gospel, the operative word is left out and that's faith. You gotta invite Christ in your heart. You've got to, 
uh, seek God, or just a multitude of things. And then the last one here, by adopting the views of prominent people, movie stars, politicians, and internet gurus. Now those, those people, prominent people, and prominent people, I'm talking about politicians as well. Have you ever noticed when a politician quotes the Bible 99% of the time, it's out of context? The only reason they're doing it is not to impart God's word, but to get a leg up on the, on the opposition. And it's twisted most of the time. So prominent people, movie stars, m movie stars are pretty much vacuous. Because they're not learning as they go. They're taking words that other people have said. They memorize them and they speak. Oh, but the movie star. And you talk about the people on the news. They're news anchors. No, they're guys that read the, read the news. They're just reading the script in front of them. But they're news anchors. And people think they're somebody. And the young people think, oh, well, they must know what they're talking about. And most of the time, they don't know squat about anything. There are exceptions. When I was growing up, Walter Cronkite was the man, wasn't he? Y'all remember? I mean, I thought the, and his, he had that radio voice. And he was just, I thought he was something. And then, later on, I kind of forgot about him a while, and then he came back into view, and I found out that he was a flaming liberal. Big time! I never knew it before! And the last one by what they have learned in life, their experience, the school of hard knocks. And of course, that is a rough teacher. But that's where you learn the most. School of hard I don't I don't suggest that you enroll, but many of us have in the past. One thing about graduating from the school of hard knocks you do not forget. Okay. Only a few this is where we left off right here. We're starting lesson 151 here. This is all by way of review, which I do not apologize for because that is the best teacher. The best way that you remember is through review. And I've got so many other things to teach. I want to just fly through it, but I'm trying to do better. So we're going back and catching a little bit to get us into the mode. And then, now we're talking about people who don't have the proper standard of truth, which is, of course, God's Word. Only a very small percentage of our population uses the Word of God as their standard of truth in making decisions. Do you understand that? Very small. Of course, this is because the great percentage of people, including Christians, are biblically ignorant. They have no idea where to go in Scriptures to answer any questions about anything. And I'm talking about Christians for the most part. It can be very disconcerting to find out as an adult that nearly everything you learned growing up was untrue. It usually started with finding out there is really no Santa Claus. And people always, I've had people all but threaten to put me down and hog tie me to put a Santa Claus suit on it and I said I'll fight to the death. I never saw anything cute about lying to kids. But a lot do, a lot of people. Many people are finding out that getting a college degree is not the silver, silver, silver bullet that they were led to believe. Hundreds of thousands of young people who leave college are debt-ridden and have difficulty finding high-paying jobs. Now, what I'm saying is, I'm not, I'm not disparaging college, but I will say this. We've been in a state of arrogance for about, I guess, five decades. That's about how long it's been since I graduated from high school. And when I graduated from high school in 1966, people would come up to ask me, kids would come up and ask me, this is what they asked me, what college are you going to? They didn't ask me, am I going to college? They said, what college are you going to? Because already then, they were manifesting in the young people's mind that if you don't call, go to college, then you're just somebody just fell off the turnip truck. I mean, you don't know squat. And they would, the counselors would tell you, now, you can go to college, a four-year college, and you can have so-and-so, so-and-so, and so-and-so. 
Or the alternative is, that's the way they presented it. Of course, kids, they don't want to be a bumpkin, you know. They want to do what, and, and of course, over the years, college got more and more expensive. And now, uh, there was a piece, well, in the bulletin, that's what it was. Remember college, uh, uh, Colorado State College, I think it was, uh, did a piece of some kind of insanity that um, had to do with genderism or whatever. And I looked up how much it cost to go to that school, and it's anywhere from, to graduate, it would be anywhere to 75000 to 175000 I think it was, the, let's see, about, I think it might have been more than 75000 And if you were out of state, it was even more. Anyway, it was, it's obscene what it is. And so young people are finding out the truth the hard way. Because they believe the lie. Because the trade schools, they made you feel like you were just a tad below par. I mean, you really couldn't hardly make it in life. You were scorned. You were uh, embarrassed. It made you feel embarrassed if you went to a trade school. And right now, I see ads on the Internet that say they desperately need 250,000 electricians right now. And probably the same with plumbers and carpenters. These people are making over $100,000 a year. Now, who's laughing now? The reason I'm doing this, I'm just showing you how easy it is to believe the lie because what we're talking about is truth. And it's hard to find truth in our society. Okay, now we're in tonight's lesson. Most parents did a lousy job of informing their children about sex and what it takes to be a good husband or a good wife. It's nearly non-existent. Children have received, I'm talking about children of my age, I can, all, all I know is about when I was growing up, children have received the obligatory story about the birds and the bees. Maybe some haven't, but that's, parents feel obligated to tell them this. But they remain ignorant about how to remain chaste in our sex-saturated society. I don't know what it is like now. I have no idea, but when I was young, when I was at an age to where I was curious, what's, what's, what, what's these differences here? The parents were embarrassed. They wouldn't even bring it up. Or they might get to where they were so ashamed, they would say, uh, here's a book. Or they would, you know, just grit their teeth and give you the mechanics of how it all works. And then they think, okay, I did my job. It probably would have been better if they had said nothing. And by the way, this is when your friends, you learn supposedly truth from your friends. Ha! Mm. They are unable to navigate the minefield of lies about sexuality. That was back then. Back then, homosexuality was not even mentioned. We didn't, nobody even said anything about it because it was, it was as if it was non-existent. It was existent, but they all kept it under covers. Think of what the minefield that it is now. So they are unable to navigate the minefield of lies about sexuality. They were never told why it is important to remain a virgin until marriage, or why the wife is to be submissive to her husband, or that homosexuality is an abomination to God because it can destroy a marriage, a family, or a nation. These things are not taught. Even to this day they're not taught. And the children go out there and they are just going into the meat grinder of lies and abominations and perversion. And we wonder why they come out the way they have, so many of them. We, really, it's not the kids' fault. It's the parents' fault. That's the number one, the, the parents' fault. A lot of times over the years, they were too busy trying to make a living and pay taxes and so forth, so they just take the kid and put him in front of a TV. Or have child care. Who knows? God knows what goes on at these child care centers. And so we are reaping that harvest. But the point is, whether you're prepared or not, these things are going to be ongoing, and if you are a loving parent, 
then what you're going to do is get everything in that paragraph, you're going to make sure that when your child leaves the nest, they understand why it is important to be a virgin and how girls need to learn that if they get married someday, that their God has delegated the authority in that union to the man. It's not something bad, it's something fabulous. He also commands the man to love her as Christ loved the church. They have no idea how marriage is structured. structured. But I, at least, the, look at this next paragraph. At least half of the younger generation do not even bother to get married these days. Another lie. Thinking that, well, why would we want to get married? We'll just live together, see if everything works, and then, then maybe later we'll get married. Well, even the statistics show that that's a lie. People who get married are, are about 50% more likely to stay married. And so they're, they're buying another lie there. They don't know that God condemns move-in, non-commitment type arrangements. That is condemned severely by God. Because if you're not married, if you don't make a commitment to God in front of witnesses, then as far as God is concerned, you're fornicating. It is that commitment that he requires. They have no idea what the divine design for marriage is. Go up to any young person, and I'm saying young, let's say from, I don't know, 17 to 30, or 12 maybe, I don't know what it is these days, but you go up to them and say, uh, how has God designed marriage to work? How, can you tell me the mechanics of how this is supposed to go? You go to most girls these days, whether they're teenagers or whether they're in their 20s, in their college or whatever, and you suggest that if they get married, God has required them, commanded them to be obedient to their husbands, and you'll probably have to get some, some uh, what do they call it, self that what is it? Not oh no, it's the one that huh? Smelling sauce. They'll probably faint right on the spot. If not, they'll get very angry. But what? They they bought the lie. So they have no idea what the divine design for marriage is, and that it is the only way a man and woman can live together and have a blissful and rewarding relationship. They have to know there is no other way. Oh, you can stay married and be each other's throat from, the, from then on. And what happens most of the time when the culture that we live in are emasculating males and prompting the females to be more aggressive and compete with men, Take their jobs. After all, we're all equal. And so what happens is they're not going to have a blissful and rewarding relationship. It is impossible to do it if you, if you don't know how God structured marriage. And if you have the man that is submitting to the wife, that is going to be anything but what God wanted marriages to be. can't be. There's that tension. The, the women are trying to compete for the headship and the men have been so emasculated by feminism and our culture that if they do assert themselves, they feel guilty. They think they're misogynists, that they're some kind of dictator, some kind of brute. God requires husbands to assert their authority. For if you don't assert your authority, you will surely lose it. Young men aren't taught anything like that. They're believing the lie. I'm trying to point out how scarce truth is in our society and in our world. I'm just giving you examples. In fact, biblical truth for the most part has been completely ignored or avoided in the upbringing of young people in our America. And how sad. This is an important truth here. God will never accept or bless a nation that has rejected his truth in order to embrace satanic lies. How can anyone that knows anything about what's going on in this country say that we as a country are not embracing satanic lies? Across the board we are doing it. 
And those who know it's wrong are not standing up to this. They're wanting to hide in the corner somewhere and not be seen. This is the time for us to be men. That's what the Bible says. And they say, be strong. Be courageous. And this is for women too. That means we take the opportunity to stand for these things, these truths, in the midst of a society that has degenerated to the point to where it's all but gone. So unfortunately, America is in the process of rejecting God's truth and it will continue to do so unless believers like us speak God's truth to those who have ears to hear. Where else are they going to hear it? We need to take advantage of every opportunity to speak the truth in love. And I back this up with Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14 and 15. If we love our neighbor, if we love our children, if we want to survive as a nation, we have to speak up. Take the opportunities. And of course, you have to use discernment, and I'm not talking about arguing. I'm talking about just laying it out there what God requires of us for us to even survive. Do you realize that if we keep ignoring God and keep embracing satanic lies that we won't even survive as a people, as a nation? No nation ever has. And that's not going out. Young people never heard of such a thing. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 14. We should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine. That's describing most believers today that go to church. They're not dogmatic about anything. They're not assertive. They're still questioning themselves. They haven't got the training that they need to have dogmatism, to be able to stand up and say, Thus saith the Lord, and this is, this is wrong. This is the right way. Because they're tossed about by every wind of doctrine by trickery of men in the cunning of craftiness of deceitful plotting. We should stop all of that. But, contrastive conjunction here, speaking the truth in love. May grow up in all things un into him who is the head, Christ. So all this craftiness, deceitful, plotting, cunning, being tossed about every wind of Doctrine is crapola. And what we need to do is speak the truth in love, but you can't speak the truth if you don't know the truth. But how many Christians know the truth and are not speaking? They're not looking for opportunities. They're looking for escape exits whenever the opportunity presents itself. What are they afraid of? Are they afraid of persecution? They might be embarrassed. Ephesians 4.25 Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. It's fashionable to talk about anything you want to talk about. But leave Jesus in the Bible out. Because once you go there, people start shutting down. What's the two most controversial issues that you can converse about? The Bible and politics. Why we are afraid. And why should it be that way? You see, if you know how to reach these people and you don't preach to them, but you ask them questions, if all you have to do is when you ask questions, get them to think if you can even do that, you can move them light years ahead of where they were. They just don't think. They just repeat. They parrot phrases they hear from somebody and they hadn't connected. They don't know anything. But when you ask them questions, for, let me give you this example. Let's say you go to your neighbor and you, you haven't talked to him about your church or the Lord or the Bible or anything. And so you go over there and you buy, borrow the um, weed eater. He said, oh, by the way, 
Do you go to church anywhere around here? I don't know what you see, you never know the answer. But it doesn't know it doesn't matter what the answer is because the next question, I mean I gave it away. The next thing you say is another question. If he says, Well, I don't go to church, then you're asking, Oh? You know, that means it's your turn to talk. You tell me why you don't go to church. Or, oh yeah, I do go to church. Oh, which one? You you find out a lot about them just asking questions. And they don't usually feel threatened because you're not preaching to them. You just want to know more about them. And so you ask them. That's the, that's the thing that people are afraid of. They don't know where it's going to go and they feel insecure. But listen, when you're asking questions, it doesn't matter where it goes. Every time you ask a question, you're getting more information leading them closer and closer to the gate. The gate is the gospel. And finally, you can, through questions, give them the gospel. Why isn't that being done? Well, they won't like me anymore. I might be embarrassed. Oh, so they're going to spend eternity in hell because you're uncomfortable? Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor for we are members of one another. Now notice, I want to make this sure, sure that you understand this. Notice we are to speak the truth in love. You don't preach, you don't, you're not a know-it-all. And if he asks you a question you don't know, be honest. Don't make something up. Say, I don't know, but I'll tell you what, it's a good question. I'll find out. And next time we get together, I'll let you know. Got another, another time to talk to him. How we speak the truth as, is as important as what we speak. If they sniff out even a hint of legalism, you're done. They won't listen to you whatsoever. And if you start preaching to them, they'll turn off in a heartbeat. So what you're doing is just having a conversation, talking to them, trying to find out where they are. If they say, well, I'm uncomfortable with this, what are you going to say? Oh, I better leave. No. What are you going to, why? Why are you uncomfortable? All I'm doing is I'm just, I'm just a sinner talking to another sinner. I'm just curious. I care for you enough to, Want to know you better. Why would that turn you off? And then he's going to say something else, and if it's something along the same line, you know what I'm going to say? Well, why, why are you like that? Where did you get that idea? Why do you feel like that? You're just talking to him. You're not this super saint that thinks he's better than everybody else. And you, you don't come across as a know-it-all. So what I'm saying is, how you speak, if you are in humility and you're just trying to love this person enough to get on the right conversation, the right wavelength, so that you can segue over to where you can actually give him the gospel and it not be uncomfortable or odd or awkward, that's being as wise as a serpent and as gentle as a dove, which we should be. If we are trying to win an argument or we have a combative manner, people will think that we are stubborn just trying to prove that we are right and they are wrong and they won't listen. What happens? I've heard people, I've asked people, well, what do you say to this person when you're talking to them? And if I was the one they were talking to, I wouldn't talk to them either. Mainly because they didn't ask any questions. They just, blah, 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 blah. They're just spewing out all this stuff into this person. It's like crap coming through a fire hose. I mean, it's just, I don't mean to be ugly about it, but I'd say it through their eyes. They think you're, you're a know-it-all, that you're a super saint, you're full of self-righteousness. How do you know that they're not thinking that? Just have a conversation. And if it gets to where they're uncomfortable, ask them why. Is that hard to do? How else? Are the masses of people going to get to hear the truth? That's what we're on, truth. That's the first thing. To maintain that peace that passes all understanding in verse 7 is this list to meditate on. And if you are, if you're relaxed 
and you have peace in your own soul, it's not going to be like you have a quota, you've got to go out and meet so many people. It's just you're living your life. And when the, when the uh, guy comes in to fix your refrigerator, and you have to be careful, you have to have discernment. If he's in a hurry, it might, not, it might be best not to say anything. And usually they are. They have to get to the next thing. But you always have time to say, uh, here, won't you take this booklet with you? Website's on the back. Won't you check it out? Have a good day. Is that hard to do? The one that I pass out is, what are you working for? See, they're there working. And the, pack, the booklet back there is, what are you working for? I guarantee you they're going to read it because they're workers and they're going to question have you ever noticed on the publications that I have back there, most of them are questions? Have you noticed that? Nearly all of them are. You see, when people see the cover and it's a question, they're curious. They want to know what it's about. Power of questions. So we treat others with unconditional love and respect and they will be much more likely to listen to us and accept truth. You treat them with respect, unconditional love, and listen, please don't do this. When they say something like, uh, well, yeah, I go to church and uh, we speak in tongues. Shame on you if you don't ignore that. Oh, that rule! Oh! People do it, though. They think it's their duty to talk to someone that may not even be a believer to straighten them out on a non-essential like tongues. And now they've made an enemy. That person doesn't want to hear anything about it because you just make the assertion that they're wrong. And now it's a contest. Now it's a debate, and they want to win. Christians obviously are not being taught how to speak to these people. I hear it all the time. And they go away. Well, I guess I said them straight. No, you just lost the soul. I mean, you didn't lose it, but you certainly didn't, didn't, were not instrumental in saving it. Just have a conversation with them and ask them questions. First John chapter 18, uh, excuse me, first John chapter 3, verse 18 through 19. This is the New Living Translation. Dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. See, we're talking about truth still here. You can show the truth of God that is in you by your actions. And actions speak louder than words. So, dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. Verse 19. Our actions will show that we belong to the truth. Who is the truth? Jesus Christ is the truth. So we will be confident when we stand before God. How many believers are going to stand before Jesus Christ at the great white, I mean at the, uh, uh, at the Bema seat? Yeah, the judgment seat of Christ. How many believers are going to stand before him? Yeah, all church age believers, which includes us. So we can be confident that if our actions go along with what we've been meditating on, we just went through one so far, truth. There's, I think, what's eight of them? Seven or eight, something like that. When we do that, then our actions should comport with our words. And we'll be confident we will stand before God. Okay. We are done with truth for tonight. <laughs> I don't mean we're done. In fact, we ought to be kicking into gear in truth. See, you people are, and those who are watching, and those who go to a, usually it's a Bible church, but not all of them by far. But if you're going to a church where the doctrine is being exegeted and disseminated, and you are hearing it and you are learning it. You've got wisdom. You have discernment in your soul. Do you have any idea how valuable that is? You don't go through life questioning, well, should I, what should I, should I be for gays or against gays or 
should I be for this? Or you don't have any, any of those doubts because the, the solution and the answers are in the Word of God. But what good are they doing other people if you are not going to engage with them? And I know you, it can be risky. And you have to use discernment. You have to be humble. But I, I am, again, saying with dogmatism that if you don't preach, but you ask questions, you're going to find out a lot more about them because most people, their favorite su subject is themselves. And when somebody's interested in them, they're ready to talk. And that's what you need to do. You need to listen more than you talk. And you're going to learn a tremendous amount about them and you'll know where to go in the conversation. And if Christians don't start doing that and fast, our country is gone. Half of our country is already gone. And that's, that's, people don't want to admit it. Are we a great nation? Yeah, we're a great nation in some ways. But when it comes to the most important reason why we're a great nation, we are not a great nation. For the most part, we are a God-hating, truth-resisting bunch of pagans. That's the way our country is. That's the way it is. And where are, where are the Christians? Where's the outcry from Christians? I'm not saying that we're better than them, but just standing for truth. This is what this whole thing is about. It's truth. You have it in your soul. Why would you want to put your bushel of your candle. You have truth. It's like a light. Why are you not taking the basket off and for all to see? And I'm talking to me as well. And it starts with baby steps by just looking for opportunities. And it's kind of scary at first if you haven't done it. Just ask them some inane question. Are you from around here? Oh, uh, well, no, I'm from so-and-so. He said, oh, well, you go to church there? These are innocuous questions. They're, they're not threatening. And they don't want to tell you. If they've gone to a church and it was a <clears throat> legalistic church, I don't go to church anymore. What is your next question? See how easy it is? Well, why? What happened? Oh, well, they hit me up for money and were so legalistic and everything. And then you can make a statement. You can say, I don't blame you. I wouldn't want to go there either. But then you follow that up with a question. Did you know that all churches aren't like that? Did you know that? Did you ever go to a church that actually taught the Word of God and lived by every word of the Word of God and were able to handle life's issues because they had God's Word circulating in their mind? Did you, did you ever know that? Whatever, see the Holy, if you're in the, in the, filled with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is going to guide you in all that. You don't have to make a plan. I mean, you don't have to make notes or if he says this, I'm going to say that. If you have, you have the knowledge, if you have the desire, God is going to open up opportunities that, and you have the Holy Spirit and he's going to guide you in all of these things. I'm just trying to nip in the bud some horrible, fatal flaws that Christians make and they don't even know they're making it. And maybe you can actually change someone. You can not change them, change their thinking because they never heard how wonderful our God is. They really don't understand what grace is. And if you can even reach one person, wouldn't it be worth it? If you've never given someone the gospel and they accept it and they can't get enough doctrine, then you don't know happiness and exhilaration that is out there because it just puts you on cloud nine. I mean, if you haven't done it, I mean, you, you just thank the Lord. It's such a joyous thing that God actually used you to save somebody else. And for all eternity, nothing can change that. It cannot be erased. So I didn't know this was going to turn into a, um, a lecture pretty much on reaching others. But I, I did want to challenge you. You have the truth. 
And I know some of you do it. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. And the opportunities arise every day. But you have to use discernment. If I was you, I think you ought to do what I do. And I pray to the Lord to say, you know, I want to impart truth that I have to others, but it's not an easy thing to do. But if you give me the opportunities then I ask you to direct me as I am having a conversation with these people and asking questions. And you will be surprised what happens. We are out of time. We'll continue next time on whatever things are honorable. Boy, do I have a PowerPoint on this one. I thought I would get to tonight, but I never know what's going to happen. Let's close. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that this life is all about you, and you have impressed upon us that that is so. And as we see our beloved country coming apart at the seams, and we see the hostility and the hatefulness and the disparaging of everything that is holy, God's word and the Lord Jesus Christ is mocked and scorned. This is a time for us to be brave, to be courageous, to look for opportunities and see how you can take the most, the darkest and the, the people who are enslaved to hate. And the word is so powerful, the gospel can reach in and turn a switch on, a light switch, even in the darkest of souls. Help us not to be afraid and to continue to rely on you in all things and see what you can do in our lives. Phenomenal grace. We thank you for this. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.